bones. Ghosts. Ancient civilizations. The supernatural. We may never know the truth about what's really going on. But it sure is fun to speculate. This is Factor Theory Live with your host, Stephen Crawford. All right, welcome, welcome to the show, everybody. Oh, give me a second here. Echo through there. Uh, I am Steve Crawford, like the intro said. Tonight, I would like to talk about something that uh, has fascinated me for a long time, a subject that really started to float my boat shortly after I found out about Nikola Tesla. I probably spent about a month looking for everything I could find on Tesla and my mind was blown about that. Then I happened upon something called Behail, uh, Behold a Pale Horse. And, you know, I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And the way he talked, Bill Cooper, it, it took him a while, but uh, he really got a, a command over his audience, mixed in the humor and everything. And the things he talked about, ultimately uh, had to have some part in his demise and he used to have a show that I was lucky enough to hear and, and he's one of these guys you ever have a conversation with your friend and they're like you know who, who'd you like to go back in time and, and sit down and have a beer with he's definitely in the top three it, it's got to be Tesla Bill and probably Phil Schneider and um, I came across his show, The Hour of the Time, and it was about the moon landing. And again, I was like, you know, now I see why this guy was... And this was before I even realized what he had predicted about 9-11, and he was killed shortly after that. <coughs> Excuse me. And everything he was saying was like, that's what I've been saying. You know, it's what we all think, right? It's like, yeah, why didn't they do that? Why didn't they do this? And I had posted something about it. The guys in uh, the host chat on Skype were talking about it. Uh, I think Mechanic was one of them, actually. Uh, okay, good job tonight, guys. Lady Horse, Mechanic, uh, Chair Bear. Very funny, dude. Um, so it... it brought me back to I wanted to do a show about Bill and then Phil and I was going to but tonight I was going to uh, play an older I've got one more access to one more of my older interviews this was not all that old it was only a few months old uh, it was Laura Eisenhower and I'm gonna play part one of that. that's like a two-hour interview so I'm gonna play part two of that or part one sorry after the break but before the break I want to get into uh, Bill Cooper and everything that that show that he had put out just made so much sense and lent so much more credibility to everything that everyone had been saying about his death and uh, the suspicions of, you know, he was killed for not paying his taxes, you know, what, what the hell, and uh, he had to send his wife out of the country and stuff, but I had posted it on Facebook earlier uh, something about Bell Cooper and Dan Willis had posted that yeah he was right and uh, sent the link for a certain spot on his site the webmatrix.net and you go down to 1968 and it starts uh, oh just above that that's kind of interesting uh, what happened when we went to the moon first of all it's not our moon Second of all, it's not a moon. Uh, SSPW Tompkins, not sure who that was. but And then 68, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, Stanley Kubrick film. Now, he gets into it by starting a, man, uh, a milestone film by Stanley Kubrick. In the movie, humanity finds a mysterious, obviously artificial object buried beneath the lunar surface. The stage for 2001 with all those lunar sets was filmed in 1968, directly before the moon landing in 69. 
Researcher Jay Wiedner spent 15 years investigating into the strange death of Stanley Kubrick. Wiedner believes we did go to the moon, but what we viewed on Earth was completely staged because uh, it was a staged video feed utilizing Kubrick's lunar movie set. The show was for our benefit only. Governments could never tell the general public what they found on the moon. And that makes perfect sense to me. And what I was getting at with Dan, my point was, uh, okay, so if they had to fake that first one, for, for obvious reasons, there were aliens there, well, that means that the rest of them were faked as well. So the uh, entire Apollo moon landing was really, they tried, don't get me wrong, they I would hate to think, that uh, Gus Grissom was killed for nothing. Uh, Grissom, Chafee, and White. That would really suck if that was for nothing. But uh, ultimately, they could not go in the tech we were seen, or sorry, we were shown, and they utilized some secret space tech, I believe. But uh, Dan, Dan's finally in line with that too because of all of this stuff that he had found out and has on his site which is fantastic I suggest that you come over and check it out um, okay uh, the show was for our benefit only governments can never tell the public what they found on the moon which he believed were ancient ruins and the surface was crawling with extraterrestrials now that's probably an overstatement but still and it had to be sanitized from the public view back on earth Kubrick was secretly fascinated with the Nazis, and he was secretly fascinated with Nazi technology, and was also hanging out in the early 60s. After he finished Dr. Strangelove, late 63 through 65, he was hanging with Arthur C. Clarke, who was helping German scientists coming from Germany to work for NASA. And he was instrumental in support, in supporting a lot of these scientists, and he literally would have parties and gatherings at his apartment in London, and Werner von Braun would be there, all these big wigs in the space pro uh, program that were German, and there would be Stanley Kubrick, who could only be 32 or 33 at the time, married to a German, upper crust German woman, whose brother, Christian Kubrick's brother, Christian Kubrick's brother, was Lenny Reffenstahl's cameraman. Uh, Lenny was Hitler's favorite filmmaker, so this thing is much deeper than we can ever imagine. And I think that Kubrick was completely aware of the German involvement in the flying saucer programs that we started to complete in White Sands, and also the alien contact that was going on at the time. And we have William Top Tompkins, who confirms that in the 50s he was working, designing spaceships that were miles long. And this is the reason why we picked Stanley Kubrick as backup. So it, it makes perfect sense why they had to do it now. And a lot more people are coming around to that. Okay, we, you're not saying we didn't go. You're just saying Apollo was fake. Yes, that's what I am saying. We did go, but Apollo was fake. And it had to be for obvious reasons. If that is the case, that aliens were there. And, and I believe it was. Uh, let me list Skype thing here. And so I had prepared, and hopefully this is going to work out, and you may have to turn your volume up a little bit, because I've been having audio issues. But this is a very special, uh, fair use claimed the hour of the time, with Bill Cooper using NASA's own math and, and their science to base his assumptions, and, and they're not really assumptions, that's another reason they hated him. It was considered the most dangerous talk show host in America because he actually went for facts and science. But if this works, here we go. The hour of the time, Bill Cooper. You're listening to the hour of the time. I'm William Cooper. In one-sixth gravity, everything would weigh one-sixth or 16.7 percent of its earth weight. In other words, a 180 pound man would weigh a mere 30 pounds. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm going to strip away some of the bullshit that NASA's been shoving down your throats for years. Writers were speculating 
on the athletic abilities of men on the moon a long time before the space program and Apollo. They based their calculations on one-sixth gravity because that's what the scientists told us the gravity on the moon would be. And the public was anticipating some of these spectacular athletic feats when astronauts explored the moon. Do you remember seeing any? None were ever performed, ladies and gentlemen. There just weren't any. And you say, well, they were weighted down with these big, giant, heavy suits. Mm-hmm. I got a bridge. You want to buy it? You may remember the televised pictures of astronauts moving around on the moon's surface. If so, we challenge you to recall any extraordinary feats at all. Because in all actuality, ladies and gentlemen, there were absolutely none. Zero. Zilch. Zip. Nothing. In the November 1967 issue of Science Digest, an article appeared by James R. Berry entitled, How to Walk on the Moon. In it, Mr. Berry predicted that men would be able to make 14-foot slow-motion leaps, perform back flips, and other gymnastics just like professionals and be able to easily move up ladders and poles with their arms, not even having to use their feet. Another prediction was given in 1969 by the writers of U.S. News and World Report in an article entitled, U.S. on the Moon. Look it up. And they said, with gravity on the moon only one-sixth as strong as it is on Earth, a home-run hitter in a lunar baseball game could drive a ball well over half a mile. A golfer's drive from the tee would sail clear over the horizon out of sight. You wouldn't be able to see where it landed uh, even if you wanted to. See, the height an object will rise in a gravitational field, ladies and gentlemen, depends upon its initial velocity. And if an object had the same initial velocity in one-sixth gravity as it had on Earth, it would rise six times as high. If the initial velocity of the object were doubled over its Earth velocity, it would rise 24 times as high. And if tripled, it would rise 54 times the Earth height. Imagine, imagine the golf tournaments in such an atmosphere. A man jumps vertically by bending his knees and then flexing his thigh muscles to full extension. Try it yourself, right where you are. Get the feel of this so you'll know exactly what we're talking about. You see, when he does this, it propels him off the ground with a given initial velocity that can be measured. And if an astronaut were to jump vertically in one-sixth gravity with the very same effort expended on Earth, the initial velocity would be greater than on Earth, therefore the astronaut would go more than six times higher. And we haven't even gotten to these suits yet, so don't get ahead of me. We're going to cover that, folks, using NASA's own figures. You see, for the purposes of this broadcast, a conservative approach is taken, and I always do that, with anything that we talk about, simply because I know that the wolves are out there ready to jump. We take a conservative approach in determining the relative jumping ability of astronauts in one-sixth gravity versus Earth gravity. A complicating factor, folks, is the alleged weight of the spacesuits and backpacks worn by the astronauts. Now here's where the fun begins. You see, NASA claimed, NASA claimed it's their own figures. I didn't make this up, and you can check yourself. NASA claimed that the gear weighed 185 pounds. Let me repeat that so that there's no misinterpretation. 185 pounds. Now this is a terribly oppressive weight to carry on the Earth. But folks, it would be no problem whatsoever in one-sixth gravity. That is, assuming that the astronauts weighed 185 pounds 
and their gear weighed the same. And these are the NASA figures, and the astronauts, all of them, weighed pretty close to that figure. The total combined weight, ladies and gentlemen, in one-sixth gravity would be only 62 pounds. Now just ruminate on that a little bit. If the astronaut weighed 185 pounds, and his entire suit, all of his gear, weighed another 185 pounds, the equivalent combined total weight in one-sixth gravity would be only 62 pounds. And I'm here to tell you I could do amazing things if I weighed 62 pounds anywhere. Anywhere at all. But we didn't see any of that, did we? You see, this is still only one-third of an astronaut's body Earth weight without any gear. Are you beginning to understand? Therefore, the astronauts should have been able to jump vertically far higher than they could on Earth without any burden. And you remember when they were tooling around in that little car and they were spinning their wheels and the dirt was flying up, making a rooster tail? Well, folks, that dirt didn't fly up very high and it didn't stay up in the air. It came down really quick. And according to statistics, dust in a one-sixth gravity atmosphere. In fact, an atmosphere only 2% as dense as Earth's atmosphere, that dust should still be floating around somewhere, shouldn't it? But it didn't. How are we going to explain this? How does NASA explain it? Very simply, folks, they don't. They can't. They never could, and they never will. Quite a number of professional athletes, ladies and gentlemen, can jump over three feet off the ground when they are stretched out, such as in a basketball layup. These athletes are the exception. But an average man in good condition can easily manage 18 inches in a standing vertical jump. Try it in your living room. Try it right now. I don't care how much you weigh. If you can't reach 18 inches, there's something really seriously wrong. Like you might be permanently injured and trying to jump from a wheelchair. It can be assumed that the astronauts, ladies and gentlemen, were capable of attaining this on Earth with a moderate effort, especially considering the rigorous training and the physical condition which they were expected to maintain. And in fact, if they did not maintain that certain specific physical conditioning, they would not have been allowed to make their flight. Are you following? Clear! crystal crisp logic that only comes from the hour of the time and finally folks since John Young's vertical jumping during the Apollo 16 mission has been observed on film many times by all of you and by me the question of spacesuit mobility and height attained can be discussed because we've all seen it you can go down and rent videos from your local video rental store right now and watch it again. You can order videos from NASA. You can do all of these things. You see, a standing vertical jump of at least 18 inches on Earth can be accomplished by exerting an upward force of around 500 pounds by a 185 pound person. An equation can be derived which gives the relative heights attained by an astronaut in one-sixth gravity carrying a burden equal to his weight and the same astronaut on earth without a burden now it was assumed that in each case the upward forces were identical since a jump from a standing vertical position only requires the knees to bend slightly the space suits would not have hampered the astronauts appreciably the televised pictures of John Young on the moon indicated that he was able to utilize his arms and legs for jumping in an essentially normal manner with very little if any restriction now folks this is where it gets very interesting you see the resulting ratio of relative jumping ability calculated turns out to be over four over four 
Now this means that even with the astronaut gear, Young should have been able to jump over six feet off the ground if the moon had one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. Now let's be conservative. Let's say he should have been able to only jump three feet off the ground in one-sixth Earth's gravity. Did he? Not on your life. In actuality, his efforts lifted him at most, ladies and gentlemen, 18 inches off the ground. Observations indicated that Young made several attempts to jump as high as he could, but with no success in achieving a height of more than 18 inches. He is shown at the peak of one of his jumps, in one of the famous NASA photographs, and if you can obtain this photograph, you will note the position of the top of Young's helmet in relation to the flag. Now, critics might claim that he wasn't really trying. Now, if you were on the moon and you had a chance to make a record jump and you knew that you were being viewed on television by billions of people around the world, are you trying to tell me that you wouldn't really try? Really? Is that what you're trying to say? Do you expect me, William Cooper, to believe such blithering nonsense? Because I don't believe it for one second. I think Young was trying the very best that he possibly could. You might claim that he purposely kept his jumping efforts to a minimum. But if this were the case, ladies and gentlemen, a similar earth effort without a backpack and suit would have lifted him only five inches or so. And this was probably Young's last chance to demonstrate that the moon had a low surface gravity. Why on earth wouldn't he make a reasonable effort to impress the world by jumping at least three or four feet? Especially when the figures say he could have easily reached six feet off the ground in a one-sixth gravity. You see, a reasonable jump would have been conclusive proof that the moon had a low gravity and the risk of injury would have been minimal in low gravity conditions even with the backpack and suit. With the knowledge that the astronauts could only jump about 18 inches on the moon, and assuming that the gear weighed what NASA claimed, and assuming that they were really on the moon when they made this jump, which is quite an assumption based upon all the evidence that we've been able to gather here. Moon gravity is conservatively calculated to be at least 50% of Earth gravity. Now, if NASA overstated the true weight of the astronaut's gear, moon gravity would be appreciably higher. Evidence to follow, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present it to you during this broadcast, suggests that the astronaut's gear weighed no more than about 75 pounds total. That's right, 75 pounds total. But even if it did weigh 185 pounds, as NASA says, we've already given you enough proof to show that NASA's been lying to us for a long, long time. The moon's gravity was calculated to be 71% of the Earth's based on the following assumptions, ladies and gentlemen, that John Young jumped 18 inches on the moon, his space suit and backpack weighed 75 pounds on Earth, and he could manage 18 inches on the Earth without any burden. Now, even if that's wrong, if his suit actually weighed 185 pounds, it would still say that the moon's gravity was at least 50% of Earth's, assuming that all of these other things are constant. A lot of writers, ladies and gentlemen, seem to give the impression that the moon suits worn by the Apollo 11 astronauts were extremely restrictive. Yet the following information take from we Reached the Moon by Wilford indicates that this was not necessarily the case and in any event observed actions of the astronauts during the filmed portions of their activities on the moon shows that they moved around easily. 
They did not tire under this supposedly great burden. They were able to take long excursions, conduct explorations, chip off moon rocks, plant flags, set up experiments and equipment, much of which was left on the moon. Wilford, you see, mentioned that Neil Armstrong found that he could move around easily in his bulky spacesuit and heavy backpack under a lunar gravity one-sixth of Earth's. The costume, according to NASA, weighed 185 Earth pounds and was flexible enough so that the wearer could walk, dig, climb, and even place instruments on the moon's surface. Wilford also indicated that the astronauts did not find walking and working on the moon as taxing as had been forecast, and that they bounded about easily in what they called kangaroo hops. In all actuality, looked no different than a kid skipping sideways along the street. The idea of one-sixth gravity, folks, presents a major problem in explaining how the astronauts really performed compared to how they should have performed. You see, the difficulty in jumping can in no way be attributed to spacesuit bulkiness. However, a substantial lunar gravity would create problems and why would they lie about the gravity and why would they continue to lie about it even unto this day if the gravity was not the one-sixth earths as they have stated why lie why lie ladies and gentlemen well we don't really know unless they really didn't go to the moon or unless maybe they went to the moon, but the televised and photographed portions of what the astronauts supposedly did on the supposedly moon were not really on the moon, but were filmed somewhere else. And why would they do that? Well, no one really knows that answer either, unless maybe they couldn't really get to the moon, or unless they were afraid that some catastrophe would happen and they did not want this to be seen by the American people although I don't know how they would have explained the disappearance of all the astronauts had such a thing really happened isn't this interesting in view ladies and gentlemen of the information that I have presented thus far it may come as no surprise to you that security control extended to the astronauts conversations on the moon as well as to mission control you see the ability to delete and edit undesirable comments made by the astronauts could always be accomplished before transmission to the public they claim there was a delay from the time mission control received the information until transmission to our television sets but all of that could have been staged also but let's assume that there really was a delay why not? And we're assuming an awful lot of stuff here, all based upon the information that NASA has given us, most of which turns out not to stand in the face of logic or in the face of scientific evidence or in the face of their own figures. I wonder why. The following is a summary of information taken from the voyages of Apollo by Lewis which points out the degree of control exercised over the Apollo mission activities you see he indicated that the astronauts tasks were all carefully plotted out in advance the explorers were expected to follow the plot as faithfully as actors in a play to stay on schedule every move was planned timed recorded and every deviation from the plan had to be explained and justified ladies and gentlemen virtually every event and movement was governed by the flight plan a script as large as a telephone book now it seems to me that even the dialogue was carefully controlled especially when the astronauts knew they were being filmed are recorded for television and this proves out to be a fact and it can be demonstrated when references to a hot mic are made by one of the astronauts and you can also find that on the tapes
Apollo 12 was a more extensive mission than the first moon landing, whereas Armstrong and Aldrin spent only two and a half hours on the moon. Conrad and Bean would spend a total of more than seven hours venturing a half mile from the spacecraft, or so they said. When you examine the photographs, the horizon in every single picture is always exactly 100 meters from the camera. Now, I have a degree in photography, folks, and I can tell you that that's absolutely true. 100 meters. Didn't matter if they were in hilly terrain, flat terrain, bumpy terrain, no terrain. The horizon was always 100 meters from the camera, wherever the camera was. This mission was to involve many scientific experiments, including an aluminum foil solar wind collector. And we'll discuss that on another broadcast because that's very interesting also. So is the flag, which you can see flapping in a lunar breeze in one of the films. Amazing. In an atmosphere that's not supposed to exist, where there can be no wind, the flag is flapping in the breeze. Evidently, somebody forgot to shut the studio door. The first Apollo 12 discrepancy of significance revealing a high lunar gravity occurred just after Conrad jumped the final three feet from the bottom of the ladder to the moon's surface, and I'm not going to tell you about that until after this break. Don't go away. Helicopters all over the place out here, folks. The south of town for the last several nights. Large maneuvers involving helicopters and troops on the ground and in the air. Right now there are three black helicopters on the ground at the St. John's Airport. Don't ask me what's going on because they don't tell me what their plans are or what they're doing. But I will tell you this. There is an ominous air. And we are always ready in Arizona. Continuing with our broadcast, this information that I'm going to give you was summarized from an account of the incident by Lewis. As Conrad stood on the lunar module landing pad, he stated that the last step may have been a small step for Neil but was a long one for him. He then stepped off the pad and mentioned that he could walk pretty well, but that he had to take it easy and watch what he was doing. As Conrad was scooping up the contingency sample, Bean warned him not to fall over since he appeared to be leaning forward too far. Now supposedly it would be difficult for him to get up in the moon suit if he fell over. Conrad then stated that he did not think Bean would be able to steam around as fast as he thought he could. Now, folks, in this incident that I've just recounted to you, it seems that Conrad was commenting on the final three-foot jump since he referred to Neil Armstrong's jump down to the surface, not an intermediate step to the lowest rung on the ladder. You see, jumping from a three-foot height in one-sixth gravity would be like jumping from six inches on the earth. No big deal. Even with the heavy backpack life support systems on, the three-foot drop would have scarcely been felt by the astronauts. They should have been able to lower themselves down with their arm strength alone, and no difficulties whatsoever should have been encountered unless NASA is lying. When Conrad began to move around on the surface, he might have experienced weight problems. However, even with the alleged weight of the gear, the astronauts should have had no problems in standing up if they fell down in only one-sixth gravity. They would have been able to provide the necessary push to right themselves with the strength of probably only one arm given their physical conditioning 
one arm alone, since their moon weight should have only been 60 pounds or so. This is no big feat for a kid in high school. The evidence, folks, presented does not support the condition of one-sixth gravity. It indicates one of two things. It indicates a lunar gravity close to that found on the Earth's surface or it indicates that the astronauts were not on the moon. Either one of those conclusions, if true, proves that NASA has lied to the American people and the world for many years. A photo appeared in the December 12, 1969 issue of Life magazine, which showed Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean carrying a barbell-shaped package of instruments which allegedly weighed 190 earth pounds. Now the accompanying statement that it had a moon weight of only 30 pounds cannot be consistent with the photo which shows, ladies and gentlemen, a noticeable bow in the one-inch steel bar. Now let's say it wasn't steel. Let's say it was aluminum. But the barbell, the total weight, which NASA says only weighed 30 pounds in the moon weight, even a one inch aluminum bar would not bow like you see in that picture. What else could it have been? Balsa wood? I don't think so. The movie film of this event is even more revealing, ladies and gentlemen, as Bean carried the instrument package across what was said to be the lunar surface. The bar bent up and down, strained by the heavy burden on each end. It was also apparent that the instrument package was quite heavy from Bean's efforts and movements, something that could not have been if they were only in one-sixth Earth's gravity. Before the remaining Apollo missions are discussed, folks, it may be of some value to you to examine how the astronauts were given training to prepare them for their excursions on the moon. If a 185-pound astronaut carried a backpack life support system and spacesuit weighing 185 pounds, the combined total weight of astronaut and gear would be 370 pounds on Earth, compared to 62 pounds in one-sixth gravity conditions. And remember, we're talking total weight. Therefore, an Earth simulation of one-sixth gravity would have to lighten the astronaut and his equipment to one-third of his normal Earth body weight. Any attempt to simulate one-sixth gravity on Earth would have to be made underwater or with a special contraption which actually helps to lighten the astronaut and his burden, regardless of whether he's moving up or down. And both of these methods were employed by NASA. Both of them. However, in early 1964, ladies and gentlemen, space scientists discovered Oregon as a place to serve as a lunar workshop without using water or special devices. You see, astronauts were sent to the Bend, Oregon area to get their moon legs, so to speak. Walter Cunningham was the first to try out the moon suit, backpack, life support system, and certain tools which were to be used by Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon excursion. In the first test over lava rocks, Cunningham lost his balance and sprained his thumb, tearing small holes in the suit glove which caused it to lose pressure. Evidently a full simulation was attempted. If so, how could the NASA people rationalize the weight problem? Can you explain it? I can't. There's no way that the condition of one-sixth gravity could be reproduced in this manner. Even if the backpack were lightened considerably, the combined weight of a 185-pound astronaut and gear would be far more than three times the required lunar weight. If anything, the real purpose of the tests must have been to simulate a lunar gravity which is nearly the same as Earth's 
or to perform the experiments under the exact same conditions on the actual planet where this would be found which may have been the earth that these astronauts were able to maneuver around at all in the Bend, Oregon area with their gear on suggests to me and to quite a few other intelligent people that the gear weighed far less than 185 pounds. The ridiculousness, the absolute absurdity of the exercise makes the NASA cover-up extremely clear. Clear as crystal. Since the tests began in early 1963, it is apparent that the moon's high gravity was discovered at least as early as 1962, if that is the explanation. Or, they knew as early as 1962 that they would not ever reach the moon, or if they did, the actual moon events would not be filmed, but a play of moon events might have been filmed somewhere in the Arizona Nevada eastern Washington state deserts possibly you see throughout the early Apollo missions folks an attempt was made to impress the public that the Apollo moon suits were extremely bulky and awkward. This would greatly inhibit the astronauts' mobility on the moon, causing the public to believe that the moon's gravity really was one-sixth Earth's, or to believe that what they were seeing was really taking place on the moon, if in fact it were not. Consequently, the astronauts would be effectively handicapped and incapable of impressive athletic feats. It is somewhat unbelievable from that from the time Cunningham tested out the best available spacesuit gear in 1964 until the first Apollo landing in 1969 that little improvement was made in the suits. You see the public has always been told that the best equipment was provided for the astronauts and I can assure you, and the record bears it out, that enough money was paid to develop the very best equipment possible. A little digging brought an interesting discovery to light. In Suiting Up for Space, written in 1971, Lloyd Mallon stated the following, and I quote verbatim, as a matter of fact, Hamilton Standard had already achieved a spacesuit with 93% of nude range before October 1968. Let me say that again. As a matter of fact, Hamilton Standard had already achieved a spacesuit with 93% of nude range before October 1968. Now folks, nude range means the mobility of the human body with no restrictive clothing whatsoever. Nude, in the nude. They had already achieved 93% mobility with a suit before October 1968 when they demonstrated it before the aerospace scientists and engineers attending the fifth annual meeting of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics held at Philadelphia, Pennsylvania live demonstrations of the suit during the week-long meeting attracted wide interest and attention and I'm still quoting plus some disbelief it was hard for some of the onlookers to believe that so much mobility could be designed into an inflated space suit but it was for the advanced suit was developed to meet the greater mobility requirements of manned space missions to follow the Apollo moon landing program and would in fact be tested on the moon. Now, me and several others contend that if as early as 1968 this was the best piece of equipment available, NASA had the time and money to ensure that it would be used on every Apollo mission. And of course that was the goal. 
After all, billions of dollars were spent in sending men to the moon. It is only reasonable to make sure that once the men are there, they can perform their tasks in the best possible manner. If they were not used, then perhaps NASA wanted to continue to convince the public that the moon had a weak gravity. Or if the astronauts were encumbered, there would be less chance of a breach in the cover-up. The bulkiness and weight would be good excuses for anemic jumping and maneuvering attempts. However, what appeared to be stiff waists in the suits were shown to be a lie when they easily climbed into their lunar rover vehicle and sat down in the seats in the same position that you find yourself in a small compact car. However, it was just pointed out that the Apollo 16 astronauts had great flexibility with improved suits, yet they were still not capable of worthy jumping feats. And I ask you why. You see, the public was told that modifications were made to the space suits by the time of the later Apollo missions. In the July 1971 issue of National Geographic, in an article entitled The Climb Up Cone Crater, Alice J. Hall stated, and I quote, Apollo 15's lunar module will be able to stay on the moon 67 hours twice as long as Antares did. Improved suits will allow greater mobility as the spacemen go about their chores." End quote. Now you can compare the sizes of the Apollo 11 suits with the Apollo 16 suits and see that the latter suits were less bulky in appearance. Therefore, astronauts in the Apollo 16 mission should not have had any trouble on the moon if one-sixth gravity conditions existed. Hills should have been climbed with leaping bounds and great distances should have been covered in short time periods by the astronauts who, with their combined total body weight, equipment, and suit weight, should have weighed no more than 62 pounds. It should have been as if they had been in recapture of their youth. But that's not what we saw. Before the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, which never made a lunar landing, astronauts Lovell and Hayes practiced a traverse in Verde Valley within Prescott National Forest, Arizona. I used to live in the Verde Valley, well acquainted with the terrain, the type of soil and the rocks. This was to give them the experience they would need to reach Cone Crater on a ridge about 400 feet higher than the proposed landing site elevation. Again, I suggest to you that practices in Arizona would be totally useless if one-sixth gravity were to be encountered on the moon. What is this? Foolum day, or is this magic time? What were they about with this scam? Because that's exactly what it was. A scam. Their centers of gravity on the moon would be different from the Earth's simulations, and the Earth weights would be three or four times too high to reproduce lunar conditions. However, the practice sessions would certainly have been useful in simulating Earth gravity conditions. Do you understand what I'm telling you? If Cunningham's backpack and spacesuit had weighed 185 pounds, he would have become totally exhausted in just a couple of minutes. With a combined weight of 370 some odd pounds. But he was not. He was not. Incredibly, his 1964 simulations involved spacesuit pressure. This implies that he carried oxygen and some sort of cooling system. Otherwise, he would have quickly passed out from the heat exhaustion. And, as an ex-professional diver, I can tell you that's true. 
And all this evidence points to the conclusion that the life support systems and spacesuits were light enough for the astronauts to have performed in high lunar gravity conditions for extended periods of time because they did it with the same equipment in Earth gravity. With no problem. In addition, this was accomplished as early as 1964, ladies and gentlemen, and developmental efforts would have lightened the gear considerably by 1969, and indeed the evidence and the statements by NASA and others confirmed that this did indeed take place. The combined spacesuit and life support system weight was probably less than 75 pounds. That's what the evidence shows. Exotic light metals and the best known materials available to NASA would have assured this. Following the Apollo 13 mishap on the way to the moon, a 10-month delay was taken to re-engineer and modify the spacecraft before Apollo 14. This mission would be another attempt to reach the highland regions of Fra Mauro and the highlight of the trip was to be the 1.8 mile excursion to Cone Crater. Now problems arose because the trip was mostly uphill and the astronauts had to take turns with the modularized equipment transporter or what they called the MET, the MET. On their first EVA or moon excursion Lewis mentioned that Shepard and Mitchell moved around with dancing steps and kangaroo jumps. Unfortunately, it seems like the first excursion must have gotten the best of them because on the trip to Cone Crater, the explorers were huffing and puffing and their heart rates climbed. And they should have only had a combined weight, even if their suits did weigh 185 pounds, in one-sixth Earth's gravity of only 62 pounds. What's going on here? The difficulties were attributed, NASA said, to their semi-rigid cumbersome suits and the heavy backpack life support systems which supposedly weighed 185 pounds on Earth. Somebody is lying. It's important for you, the listener, to understand that the combined weight of astronaut, spacesuit, and life support system could not have exceeded 62 pounds using NASA's own figures in one-sixth gravity, and this could hardly be considered a sizable fraction of their Earth weight. Yet NASA claims to this day that their figures are correct. For men who were moving with dancing steps and kangaroo jumps the day before, slight hills seemed to prevent a formidable challenge. Now, if the moon's weak gravity presented such an awesome challenge to astronauts in walking uphill, then perhaps the excellent physical condition which these men were supposed to be in was overrated. It was expected to hear comments by the astronauts on the ease of moving up hills and in traversing long distances with little effort at great speed. Fortunately... Apollo missions 15, 16, and 17 did not subject astronauts quite as much to the moon's hostile environment and tremendous overpowering one-sixth gravity. The lunar rover was to transport them most of the way to their destinations. And it didn't weigh much either. And yet when we saw it hit a bump, it did not fly way up into the air, and neither does the dust kicked up by the wheels of this amazing craft. Good night, folks, and God bless you all. And God bless you, Bill. So that's, that's Bill using NASA's own math and their own science to prove how they couldn't have possibly gone. I uh, want to take this, we got a break coming up. Um, we are 100% listener supported, uh, and a lot of people don't realize what that means. That means we do not have corporate 
jerks. Let's, I'm trying to, to not swear as much as possible, but uh, we don't have these corporate jerks uh, telling us what we can and can't talk about. And that makes us an enemy to a, a lot of people that are important people that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they mess with our broadcast from time to time. So if you go up to click on donations or you scroll down and you cl click on the uh, Patreon button there, it takes you to Patreon. And there's also the store where you can get some cool stuff, uh, coffee mugs and shirts and uh, Ahmed's always adding some cool stuff in there. I've got to get the mouse pad. My mouse pad is just crumbling to crap on me. Uh, but you can uh, find us at uh, freedomslips.com and join the chat room. Uh, it was open for a while to everybody, but uh, you do that and you got to worry about uh, getting... <laughs> I know it sounds paranoid, but hey, I'm a conspiracy guy, so I can say this. you got to worry about getting trolls in there that are trying to stir up trouble, and it's happened quite a bit. And uh, i got to say, it's not cool when it does. Um, there we go. And so on the other side of the break, it'll be uh, Laura Eisenhower. <laughs> I am doubling, doubling back, back to my speaker. speaker. Uh, anyway, anyway, that was Bill Cooper. And that was the speech that just made me go, holy crap, and really swallow up anything Bill was talking about. Uh, this next interview, it's two hours, so I'm going to put one part on tonight. Uh, this was, I had been talking to Laura Eisenhower on and off on Facebook and Skype uh, for a couple of years, but hadn't arranged the time to do an interview. And this was the first time I got to do that, and we had Dan Willis with us. Uh, she had a lot of questions for Dan. And you'll notice right off the hop, I sound really scatterbrained, and I'm, I even have a brain fart. It's because at that moment, I realized my screen capture wasn't working and my uh, computer it was just not doing anything it was supposed to. So for the first few minutes, luckily I remembered that Dan was recording at the same time. So I was like, oh, okay. So let me bring this up. And this. All right, so we are here with Dan Willis and Laura Eisenhower, two of the coolest people I have ever talked to. They are both very funny. They engage their audience. They talk to their fans on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, Laura is into... Uh, I'm sorry, Laura, I'm having a brain fart. It's CosmicGaia.org? Yes. Yes, and what is it that you have... I was just there, but I would like you to tell anybody else who's listening, and Dan, what you've got going on on your site. Well, I do uh, astrological readings, and... Basically, I use it just as a tool to help people to learn about their DNA, learn about just where and how we can get activated to shift our, you know, consciousness and what's holding us back, you know, things connected to the Saturn moon matrix. So a lot of the stuff I talk about in my presentations, I'm able to kind of hone in on, an, on the individual when I work with their chart and I, you know, bring into account the 13th sign uh, that is now uh, activating right and you you're uh, you're empathic intuitive that I, I believe that's what you were saying on that uh, YouTube show I think it was called Friday Night Live yeah I definitely I'm definitely empathic and I feel pretty darn good about my intuition I went to a clairvoyant Institute which was sort of not really planned it just kind of happened and so for about two years I really developed just sort of you know opening up my ability to really see energy but I like astrology because it just grounds it more and it right. just gives it more data um, so I kind of I don't know intuitive astrology I guess okay. uh, I take it a lot further than just the planets and signs it just kind of opens up something huge for me when I do readings so exactly I love listening to uh, 
there's at least three different times now when you get into uh, Tiamat and the Archons and stuff, that's when I really start to go, whoo, perk up with the ears. And, uh, Dan, what have you got going on these days? What is exciting you and your wife these days? You've got a great house where you are off the grid, and that alone just makes you my hero. Oh, you. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca and I, we love living off the grid in the mountains. I've been doing it for about 20 years now. Uh, my my site is, is an unpro- it's not a professional site. It's just basically my online notes. After I went to Washington to testify, you know, joining other top secret military witnesses, 20 at the National Press Club back in uh, 2001, you know, being an ex-ABC newsman, I was watching what was being disclosed, you know, about 57 different species, bases on the other side of the moon, presidents, CIA directors being denied access that we've had zero point energy for decades. You know, all this was being disclosed to like 22 cameras in the back row at the largest event in the history of the National Press Club, but they... The controlled mainstream media did what's called a limited hangout, where they effectively sanitized it, made it sound like you want to have a congressional hearing based on the reality of UFOs. So being an ex-ABC newsman, I took a keen interest, and uh, it wasn't until several years ago, some media company out of Hollywood wanted me to write an article on media control with the UFO ET op, uh, subject. Right. And so I, uh, I started writing it, because I wanted to try to understand what happened. You know, I, I was looking at what was being disclosed. I thought it was part of a world-changing event. You know, mm-hmm. that, how could anything be different after today? Uh, so to understand this, I, uh, I started to put a chronological timeline together and kind of plugged in all based on the hundreds of military intelligence witnesses and authenticated, you know, classified leaked documents that surfaced and events that happened from the early, uh, you know, from the beginning of the 20th century to present day, uh, just from my own understanding, and I put it up online just to share with other people that are kind of, you know, connecting all these little pieces to try to get a, a grasp on the on the large hidden picture that uh, our our system of uh, information, our mainstream media, our education system, our entertainment industry has basically, uh, you know, uh, hijacked the planet, you yeah, know, and exactly. kept That's us technologically retarded, you know, all these exactly. years. I spent 10 years, you know, trying to scientists and inventors and one horror story after anyway that's the the long and short of it uh the webmatrix.net is the uh my uh, online notes very <laughs> detailed too you uh you go back in and you update them from time to time as well right uh whenever i see something significant that plugs in you know like uh it's interesting the q post talking about the israeli Mossad, uh you know controlling the six corporations that control the media yeah. And, you know, you go back to 1996 when the CIA director, William Kobe, was allegedly to expose child sex trafficking, the Israeli Mossad infiltrating into the CIA. Um, Also, you know, Dr. Greer was supposed to, uh, within a week, get a zero-point energy device that was extraterrestrial derived along with 50 million in order to get it out to the world. Uh, You know, the CIA director was found floating face down on the Potomac River uh, boating accident after that happened. Yeah, he suicided himself. Jeez. Okay, Laura, uh, I was watching that video, like I said, and I believe it was uh, Friday Night Live, and uh, you also brought up something. You mentioned Hunger Games, and that brought my ears up again because I bought that book when it first came out. And I, from chapter one on, I kept thinking, is, is this a premonition or a prediction of what's about to happen? Because it sure feels like it. And even Donald Sutherland himself, who's quieted quite often. You'll, you'll see him every once in a while on like Entertainment Tonight, but it's limited. They, they don't go do in-depth interviews with him because he's awake. And he was one of the first to speak to that. Uh, what do you think about that theory, Laura? I think, you know, th- that was definitely a possibility. Um, I-, I feel we're collapsing timelines, though, and we're really being pushed to the edge, uh, you know, and-, and so much is getting exposed, and people are really getting on board, and, 
you know, it just like ripples out with, with social media and YouTube and as much as they try and censor, it just, it's too much of a wave of really important energy and information that's really exposing uh, crimes against humanity, these, you know, different child trafficking rings, um, major criminal activity that, you know, the list is so long and also weather weapons and, uh, and, and just some of these movements that are engineered to kind of create these possible scenarios in the future. But I don't feel that, that we're on that timeline. But I think, you know, having the ability to view those kind of possibilities, we can begin to, you know, collapse it and open our eyes even wider to see the different tactics that are being used to create um, even more duality and division. I just don't really feel like we're heading in that direction. And we just have a lot of like really important alignments coming. And so it's really up to us to connect to the higher octaves of these planetary bodies because they utilize, you know, planetary forces with dark technologies to, you know, control us. And I think all that's breaking this year. So, or, you know, in the next year, this new cycle that's beginning with Pluto Capricorn conjunction and everything. So I think that those t timelines are collapsing, but we have to, you know, not ever let down our guard. Exactly, be diligent. Yeah. yeah. Dan, do you uh, have a question to follow up? Oh, I just totally agree with Laura on, uh, you know, it's the, uh, the, the think tanks that engineer our perceptions and our, uh, he, you know, our consent to the things that, that, that are planned in their agendas of the yearly Bilderberg meetings and everything that coordinate the people that are the <laughs> in control of the uh, you know the main corporations that control our perceptions for the most part uh, for a lot of people a lot of people of course have uh, turned away from New York Times and CNN and you know Washington Post all these uh, main channels that parrot the same talking points over and over again that are going up against uh, what is like a tidal wave of uh, a global awakening you know you can see it all over the entire social media network like Laura was saying They're um, doing everything they possibly can to slow it down at this point, that's all they can. Well, if you if you're to believe Q, and uh, the gentleman that Kerry Cassidy was interviewing, I can't think of his name right now. All the timelines are allegedly converging, and there is only one outcome, and that's why Project Looking Glass itself isn't really uh, a worth a, a viable option for them to try to continue doing what they're doing because all the timelines, the intuitives they use all show all the timelines converging and there's nothing they can do about it I except slow us down and it's back to like you were saying with the Israeli Mossad and stuff I found I started getting in the most trouble uh, with this stuff when I started talking about Israel and that was actually to my detriment very early because they started shutting down my my largest viewers that was like 30 to 50 thousand views I'd be getting on these videos then they pretty much shut me down and I'm locked at like anywhere from 50 to 1,000 if I'm lucky now. Yeah, lots of targeting. Um, That's exactly what I wanted to bring up. Yes, Laura, could you get into that, what you were talking about, about targeting? Well, yeah, it's just the tactics to, to cause defeat and to cause, you know, when, when there's defeat, whether that's uh, with, with the kind of information a person's trying to put out there, but also spiritual defeat because when we start to switch on dormant strands of DNA and begin to connect into our galactic chakras, there's a lot of psychic attack. And it just, you know, they can really monitor and target, um, you know, really strong energies, you know, being born, uh, you know, children, advanced children being born. And, you know, we, we see vaccinations and the pharmaceutical companies and just all this manipulation to just a child's sense of identity. Um, so targeting is, I mean, the whole human race is targeted. So, you know, but, but in this field, of course, getting this information out, uh, having particular missions. I mean, I've been targeted my whole life and I know most people in this field have been targeted. Uh, I, I, it's, it's so weird to not feel it as much. And I know Dan lives off grid. I'm in the mountains myself and in the woods and I feel a lot more buffered and clear. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm actually feeling grounded. I can actually g get into my body. But, uh, at certain events, though, I feel kind of thrown, but, I, you know, you just get, get used to it. And the whole thing is, is it's just defeat because, like you said, the looking glass technologies, they couldn't see anything past 2012. And everything does end up 
uh, with it, with the inevitable result of you know great awakening and and being in an advanced frequency that is uh, an override frequency to AI and all this you know dark technology and manipulation and mind control. Well, wouldn't that be but yes, they, they won't stop at anything, and and the hope is that you know one will just give up, be defeated, say I quit. Whether, like I said, even on a spiritual level, uh, people can just feel like I, you know I'm meditating, nothing's happening. Uh, you know, even even if they've made great strides, sometimes it's like you just get shattered and thrown back to square one. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> You're yeah. describing me, and many, everybody's going to be sitting there just nodding their heads as they're listening to what you're saying right now. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Well, that's pretty much it. And you know, you just got to get back up and just brush off the dust and and just keep at it and and just never give up and that to me wins the war and the war is also one within ourselves because it's a war on consciousness we have to uh, be really authentic and true to ourselves and just work the energy and we're working a lot of ancestral stuff and I mean it's just a lot and and it feels pretty heavy a lot of times and sometimes it feels like there's no real progress but I think we're doing amazing and to be at this place in in history I just I don't know I feel so good about what's in front of us I, it's, it's gonna be intense of course but right me too, Laura. I, did, I felt like there was no hope, you know, after I saw, you know, uh, C CBS did an interview with me. And I said, I'm not going to do this unless we say we have scientists can prove we have, you know, zero point energy. They promised up and down, said the higher executives made me cut that part out. Uh, after, you know, many, many years, I thought, uh, you know, there's no hope. There's no hope. You, you, can, uh, you can write letters to your congressmen. You can send letters to your media, ABC, CBS, NBC, you know, all the... I felt, you know, they have it all wrapped up. How can this possibly transform until... Uh, you know, I think your great-grandfather may have been responsible, you know, because when he lost control to the corporations back in 1955... You know, to safeguard our republic in the future, of the constitutional republic, uh, according to some witnesses, he set up a secret U.S. Marine Corps intelligence unit that maybe what we are experiencing today is the White Hats, the, the ones that supported, you know, after Admiral Wilson was denied access to these unacknowledged special access programs that are controlled by the corporations, um, you know, he was the one that said, you know, if you can get your people together, go before the media, you have my permission, here's the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, for Intelligence, giving the go-ahead, you know, the Dr. Greer to do that. Um, it, it's a, um, anyway, going blah, 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 ram rambling off my thoughts. <laughs> so many things connect to so many things, you know, you get, get lost in it all. But, you, uh, it was about uh, you were talking about her great grandfather and how he had set up uh, a, a secret naval intelligence unit to uh, po and, and possible Marine space Corps. force even you know to protect the the office of the presidency. Yeah, I think that's surfacing as Q today. You know, I think it's uh, right. using the back channel to uh, attempt to educate since they can't get around these six corporations uh, to try to reach the public. Because, you know, while we've been fed science fiction for decades, you know, all this stuff, I mean, the, the thing is, this, the, the truth keeps its own best secrecy because it's so far, you know, like the whole thing about so uh, Project, yeah. Project Looking Glass, you know, with temporal wars going on. You know, back in the 80s, I was working with Dr. Vogel on this camera that came from England back in the 1950s that could take pictures uh, forwards and backwards in the time you know using another aspect of the uh, of the of the time field which shows definitely proved the uh, and this was patent by the European Patent Office in Paris I mean you have to prove these things work he had 10 over 10,000 photos and you could move forwards and backwards in time with this time spiral and it wasn't the same technology as uh, you know, Project Looking Glass, but it shows that there is this uh, fractal holographic nature of all reality that's all interconnected, and that right. you can attune to an aspect of it and attune to a, a particular time in that aspect of it. Well, that makes perfect sense to me, too. You would think that at, at some point, I mean, e even as far as uh, ghosts go, th there should be a proper frequency. 
and we should be able to hear these voices and we should be able to you know the right frequency view the past and future like they're saying so to, to me i don't understand why so many people are just like oh it's just unbelievable and i'm like have you not heard of nikola tesla just just nikola tesla all on his own the things he was doing 120 years ago are, are just mind-blowing so when, when i found that out to me you know nothing's off the table now and but and that some that some guys like myself that can actually be really bad because it can encompass our whole lives and it can throw us into that depression where you feel hopeless and like there is there's no no way you can get past the gatekeepers who own everything if they own all the networks how can you get on a network to tell the people what's going on right i mean uh, like well, it's really huge that uh that amy robach thing came out with you know holding that information for three years about epstein right and that that really did spread and really help people to see this dilemma of of how the media works. But Dan, did you say that you feel that Eisenhower helped to create the Q thing and and the white hats? Yeah, you know, according to uh, you know some of the great research work, you know, when we went to Washington in two thousand and one, and and you know just before the nine eleven event, uh, one of the future false flag events they had planned uh, that was disclosed. Uh, what uh, what happened was it inspired, you know, Gary McKinnon, the UK hacker, found out there was a US Navy space program going on. It also inspired and got fired, you know, Dr. Michael Sal, who I'm a big fan of his research work at exopolitics.org, who's been doing a series. Man. Yeah, and he's been doing a series on the uh, on the uh, Project Looking Glass. But what uh, what what is happening is uh, that when he lost control, you know, according to Brigadier General Stephen Lovkin, who was on, you know, Eisenhower's staff, that he had lost control of the corporations, you know, as, as you know, you and I partaked in the, the movie uh, Above Majestic, and my little piece that I put in there was talking about Eisenhower, of all things, you know, how when he set up uh, new MJ-12 operations uh, with Alan Dulles, of all people, as the head of the operation, uh, and then they moved all their operations over to Area 51 and S4, and then he was denied access. You know that whole story. Um, you know, every single president, CIA director, head of intelligence ever since that date, you know, look at uh, look what happened with, uh, you know, Kennedy. It's like uh, 10 days after he tried to get the UFO information out. He was assassinated. President Carter was denied access by uh, George Bush Sr., the Rockefeller Initiative back in 93, uh, where Clinton was saying, uh, you know, to his Sarah McClendon, there's a secret government in the government, and I don't control it. And he tried to have a CI director, James Woolsey, to gain access. He was denied access and uh, brought Dr. Greer into a meeting and said, I know the subject's real, trying to figure out why the hell I can't gain access. How do we disclose what we don't have access to? And then it was a 97 meeting with... Uh, in the Pentagon with uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Greer, and uh, William Miller, commander. And what happened was uh, there was some meetings outside of Area 51 that I partaked in one of them. The first time Bob Lazar went public, uh, no recordings were allowed, and I videotaped the, the full two hours of questions. And he talked about uh, Project uh, Looking Glass in that first uh, first uh, video. but. What uh, what happened was when those meetings happened, the base, uh, Area 51, uh, set out a um, NRO, it's a uh, you know, National Reconnaissance Office uh, uh, advisory that nobody is supposed to be next to these, connect with these people in any way. And there was a long distribution list that revealed uh, Magi Ops, Cosmic Ops, these different uh, unacknowledged special access programs, which this document was presented to uh, Admiral Thomas Wilson, and he looked into it, and he was uh, denied access, you know, and it was, uh, it was earlier this year that that meeting was substantiated by a leaked transcript after uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell passed away that revealed that uh, the Admiral was basically told to back off, not to 
inquire anymore or that he would see an early retirement, he would lose rank, and that uh, the corporations that were uh, reverse engineering technology not of this earth uh, basically didn't give him access. And, and he, that's why he said to Dr. Greer, you know, this group is illegal, quote unquote, because uh, in his legal constitutional authority, you know, he, as a head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of Intelligence, should have access, if anybody. Anyway, that was revealed uh, earlier this year. And so we still have the situation where we have these uh, rogue operations that are illegal, that uh, have super advanced technologies that, uh, you know, the world could really benefit from. And, you know, we're, we're not going to get to see it unless we actually get some more people waking up and realizing, you know, there are a lot of things that can be proven, so maybe they shouldn't just be dismissing so many obvious signs out of hand. You know, it's, uh, what, where did I want to go to that? Um, there was something else I wanted to discuss that Laura had mentioned on Friday Night Live. That guy's going to love that I keep saying his show for him. Um, <laughs> and it's the ether. This is something that has always fascinated me because I was always a Final Fantasy gamer. I would play the Final Fantasy games. And every time you ran out of magic, you had to use an ether potion to, ah. to re-up your, your magic points. So can you explain to me as far as you know what is the ether? Well, it's 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 like the substance of spirit. It's also like considered the fifth element. So if you look at the pentagram, earth, air, fire, water, ether, and it's it's a very powerful like purifying agent. But it's also considered to be like the elemental of fire, water, um, and so it just takes us into a much more direct connect with spirit, with the multidimensional, and it has been manipulated or put in reversal codes for thousands of years. And it's prevented us from having circulation with with uh, our galactic heritage and our even our higher self. Uh, our our true connection to source has just been totally manipulated. Our bodies have uh, you know aged and we die and um, and we're operating under you know just something that's uh, just been compromised and it keeps that junk DNA alive because we've got like frequency fences um, in our DNA. And so something called reversal fifty five is connected to the dodecahedron platonic solid that um, is now spinning correctly since the sun started to move through Ophiuchus in 2010 and it's a zodiac sign that's actually ruled by the element ether and 13 is very significant as a number connected to uh, the mother energy and the return of balance of the masculine and feminine and the integration of polarity that allows this scrambled, these scrambled fire codes to uh, correct themselves. I hope I'm saying this in a clear enough way but um, so having access to the ether allows us to um, recognize that spirit holds dominion over physical matter and that we can really switch on our dormant abilities and the Venus transits which the Mayans understood have you know the, the orbit of Venus has drawn a perfect pentagram in the sky and has been the planetary body behind this correction on this earth and so it's very very significant because you know the w w when we look at just these these uh, hidden you know occult groups uh, connected to the cabal Illuminati or whatever um, the inverted pentagram is symbolic of that ether being you know in the ground and the control mechanisms uh, to harvest our energy has been you know just how they collect uh, this loosh for to power up dark technologies I would say. Um, what are your thoughts, Dan, on this kind of thing? I, you know, I totally relate to that. <laughs> you know, I've been studying sacred geometry ever since that ET experience I shared with you I had back in 1977 that led me into all that esoteric uh, metaphysical laboratory research I did back in the early 80s. Um, I think... Uh, <sighs> You know, it kind of reminds me of Avatar. Yes, go ahead. The movie Avatar, <laughs> you know, the, the way that when the corporation shows up and destroys their mother tree, that, that essentially, it, to me, that was like Gaia being destroyed. These people actually would plug in to connect with nature, 
with the plants, with the animals, yeah. and with each other. And to me, Avatar was a great illustration of what the human race was meant to be, at least to a, a certain extent. And uh, you know, th everything that Laura is talking about, the changes in frequencies, uh, the chemtrails, as we speak, both of my ears won't stop ringing. You know, all these things to disrupt our frequencies and cut us off from source, including the vaccinations at birth, especially at birth. And your doctor will tell you, no, no, the, the, ba the baby's fine. He's just crying because he's, you know, he's a little scared and a little bit of the pain from the needle. No, this baby's veins are on fire because you just shot it up with 30 different vaccinations at birth. You know, and, and you, you know, I, I have to I have to interject in there is another taba uh, taboo subject is the uh, medical system. You know, my, oh. my my great grandfather was the president of the homeopathic medical uh, society that was going up against Rockefeller, who was trying to push, you know, the allopathic Do medicine. Tell. In the early 1900s, and you know, William Tompkins, one of the very well-documented witnesses, said that you know the Nazis basically, when they, you know, infiltrated not only the CIA and NASA, and, but they also infiltrated the pharmaceutical industry, and they're in control of the highest positions today in that. And if you look back at the history of uh, the Nuremberg trials and IG Farben and the connections with. You know all this, and you have to wonder. It makes you wonder, especially with all the, uh, you know, like like my mother, you know, was told she was going to die from this cancer if I take her across the border to the Gerson Nutritional Therapy, where they completely cured her. I stayed with her down there, and uh, she lived to be 91 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, only uh, radiation uh, uh, surgery and you know, pharmaceuticals are legally allowed and you have all these people that are getting uh, seriously die that try to come out with things. We have, you know, it just looks like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying this is true, but I'm just saying it looks like uh, the Nazis uh, infiltrated in and uh, are carrying on a eugenics program on the, you know, you look at the fluoride, the GMOs and the, everything else. Uh, I'm just saying it appears that way. It certainly does. It, it's like Hitler was uh, the, the poster boy, but he was also just a puppet. Like, And people can say what they want about Trump and everything else. I, I'm the guy that's in the middle. Both sides have good points, but they try to force their shitty points on everybody else. And it's like, no, why can you not just have the good thing? You know, they try to force the bad, like their raises. There's absolutely no downtime when it comes to them getting their raises boom that bill passes and their next check is in the bank a week later with that raise on it but anybody else has to wait and that is something that uh, these people seem they 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 think they're rock stars they've forgotten that they're civil servants and i think we've forgotten to to a large extent N not the three of us uh, obviously but a lot of people have forgotten that these people are supposed to be here working for us not taking things for granted like here in Ontario I was telling Dan about this Laura that it's so ex insanely expensive to live our food is about three times the price of yours a one bedroom apartment in St. Catharines Ontario is at least $1,100 a month all bills paid if you're lucky to find one like that at, at at the, I've probably got the last cheap apartment in the city. They're wiping out essentially the middle class. They're stepping up the game, and it's, I'm waiting for these white hats to come out or a Q to, you know, Q, Q's helping, but you know, I think it could work maybe just a little bit faster. Yeah. Well, with all these at attacks and assaults, the 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 saving grace is the fact that. You know, this powerful energy is coming in, you know, people tracking the Schumann resonance and the, the frequency of the, the planet and just just this whole window of ascension um, is going to override all these assaults and attacks and toxicities. Um, I just don't think that they expected us to be where we are right now. Right. If they could have clamped down the control harder around the peak of like, you know, between 2010, 2012, whatever... Um, when the ascension energies really started to flow in, they they really expected to be able to clamp down on, you know, major control. And so I'm like you, I'm on the fence. I don't get into the political as much as what's what 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 sort of operations are happening behind Trump is what's important. Exactly. Let's. I mean, it, there's so much like character blaming, shaming, and 
trying to go after every little thing. I mean, that's what obviously we're seeing with impeachments. No but uh, is there's way really more going on in the background. It's not, you know, this administration exactly. has, has done more to bring out the, uh, you know, the purge that's needed to be shown to, so so everybody can see the real criminal activity. And I don't think anything can stop that now. And we've got to look at a much bigger picture than just these elected individuals. Exactly, exactly. You know, my, my hope just went through the ceiling when back in 2017 when I saw, you know, what happens in the deep state when they have a situation like a false flag event. You know, I had to go to Vietnam in combat action because of the Gulf of Tonkin false right. flag. Well, when 9-11 happened, you know, they did, you know, Patriot Act and National Defense Authorization Act, all these draconian laws, they got to a free, you know, you know a free ticket to write all this stuff. Even Obama, back in the NDAA of uh, 2013, made it legal to use disinformation against the American public. That's right. Even though, yeah. and um, what, uh, oh, where was I going with that? Um, well, oh, what, what, what inspired me, what gave me hope was in 2017, uh, an executive order was done by Trump to block the assets of anybody doing human rights abuse or corruption, which, you know, read anybody in the cabal is involved right, in one, one, so one of the two. why they all hate him. And then, you know, changes to the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, in order to try these people and then under military law rather than civilian. And then, you know, Guantanamo Bay being expanded and then the tens of thousands of sealed indictments collecting and then, you know, Q surfacing and, you know, kind of educating the, the people with little tidbits here and there. Um, you know, now I have... I have my hope went right through the ceiling. Uh, this is like a very exciting time to be alive. Oh, it definitely is, and I mean it's it's almost surreal. It's like I, I know we all carry this this inner tension that makes it hard to sleep. Sometimes it's just like hard to function in this reality. I, I, you know, I mean, the more one's mind is blown open to what's like truly going on. The, the ability to function as a human can sometimes go through all sorts of like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah, there's so much to process. Yeah. I had to, yeah, I was like bedridden for a while, just processing and processing and processing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on and off throughout my life. And I know it's a lot for people because it, it's enough to just try and, you know, keep a roof over our head and food in the fridge, let alone process what's it's really just your normal home. everyday life. Yeah, you know. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. So. Um, but yeah, and what we're going through on a physical level as well, because this is a mass deprogramming and, 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 you know, programs exist in our bodies. It's passed down generation to generation. It's impacted, uh, you know, everything, DNA, consciousness, behavior patterns, health, um, and, uh, you know, all this drugging of humanity, you know, we're not able to be in the natural initiations you know, that life gives us to, uh, you know, have breakthroughs and, and to shed layers that don't serve us anymore. And all those initiatory experiences are stunted. And so our growth has been stunted. And, we, you know, so, so now it's all accelerating and we're doing, you know, massive work that has not been done for, th for a really long time, you know, processing things our ancestors weren't able to, speaking things that were totally shut down. And it's just like this explosion. <laughs> it's so, it's really wild. It's an, I, yeah, you know what, when, when you put it like that, it, it, it is exciting. If I can put my own personal stuff aside, I'd probably be able to see that more and I'd be able to get out of my funk a lot faster. Um, actually, there, there was something that I wanted to bring up. Have you, either of you, read or seen the movie uh, Celestine Prophecy? I read the book when it first came out a long time ago. Yeah, that, that was something that uh, grabbed me. Yeah, I think I was about 20 years old when that book ha came out. And I had read that and I actually did the experiment and I was able to see the energy between my fingers. Uh, they, they, they describe as they're getting into these books, as they're finding the prophecies and that, they teach you a little bit about the spirituality and what you need to do. It's actually a really good guide and they actually have a, uh, a, a guidebook source book for you to, like a workbook, to like you would in, in high school to uh, analyze everything that's in that book. You, so you, you would believe that that's the and they could go uh, they could shift between dimensions that's where I was going with that um, my 
biggest worry today, I think the, the thing that knocks me down the most is CERN. They are, they can still, I don't see how they cannot be a threat, uh, even to this current timeline, because, I mean, they are messing with antimatter, dark matter, uh, you know, and, and time travel. They, what, what do you guys think about that? I'm not too filled in on it. I've just started watching. I know I'm very, very scared of the fact that they all speak broken English and not very well. So there can't be great communication going on there. Well, I bet Dan knows way more about this than me. No, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah, CERN. Yeah. Okay. That, that's I heard something... a lot of their projects weren't working out. I mean, it's it's not succeeding in the way that they had hoped. I mean, human consciousness is so powerful. Um, we are multidimensional beings, and some of us I identify way more with the multidimensions and, and you know with this human realm. Yes. And and um and I I just yeah I mean we're being pushed to the edge. I mean, these dark technologies and the things that they can do. I mean, we see just these weather weapons and what, you know, it's happening in California. I mean, these agendas are real and they're still happening, but um, they are pushing us to the edge. And when enough people are awakened, that consciousness really shuts these things down because a lot of them harvest the chi of the earth and also our life force exactly. Um, exactly. through these programmings, through the manipulations of... Uh, our belief systems, our, our sense of identity. Um, so as we rise, those things begin to collapse, and we are that's, rising. That's so true, and that's why it's so important that they gain control of the masses of the per, you know, of the perceptions of the masses, because they know that we are a hive mind. They know that we're all connected as a collective mind, and that we are creating our experience. We are creating this reality, and that's why you see so much uh, normalizing of psychotic kill programming going on on television, being exposed to millions of people. That's why. Uh, the perception matrix of uh, of our news media network is, you know, that the average person, you know, that's trying to live and survive on this planet, you know, to pay the rent and the utilities, and it comes home from hard from work and turns on the evening news and gets into alpha state and gets programmed. Uh, they count on that. They count on all these millions of minds getting programmed with a certain kind of reality. But that matrix is is falling apart, you know, due in part, you know, thanks to, you know, the social media networks and, uh, you know, shows like yours, Stephen. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's true. We, uh, we are each creative beings and we are each participatory in this uh, experience that we're having. Um, in fact, I was inspired back some time ago to write this thing called on um, the webmatrix.net called Imagine This, where I did a, uh, a uh, just for the exercise for people to go into their mind and imagine like in the future, children in a, in a library of the future where science is fully taught in a full understanding of its true nature and history in its true nature and everything else. Uh, they're looking back at the challenges that mankind had by this global cabal, deep state, or whatever titles you want to give it, uh, and how through this collective awakening, they were able to transform the situation into an incredible, beautiful civilization that they were very thankful for, for the people that helped usher in this. Uh, so I was doing this uh, kind of an exercise for people to read, um, you know, just because the very act of imagining and visualizing has an effect on the collective. Absolutely, yeah, and if our creative channels are infected by these programs, we enable or we co-create a timeline or a future that we don't want to see. And so if we give it our belief, if we think, you know, doom, gloom, or we're screwed, or um, or we're in a trance and we just buy into whatever programming, even the false ascension or, you know, uh, some of the ways that they want to push transhumanism on people, you know, I mean, obviously we're going to have to find a balance between the spiritual and technological um, but yeah, it's, it's really like if we can keep our creative channels clear and just really infuse them with, you know, the future we'd like to see and we're authentic and sovereign. Um, I just I just feel, you know, we, we've we've jumped the timeline and we're we're home free in a lot of ways, but not fully out of the woods. I mean, I don't ever consider like it, it to be a done deal. I, I feel like we just get wiser and we become senior to these lower entities 
and like an immune system that gets built, it, it's easier to um, be shielded after you experience them enough. Uh, the body, you know, learns to create an immunity and a consciousness. Um, and so, you know, then it gets to the point where there's no way to penetrate. And that's why the trauma, it, you know, inflicting trauma on the human race throughout history has been such a strong mechanism of control. And on a more concentrated level, you know, in these families with this, you know, multi-generational uh, trauma-based mind control abuse in these family lines to, yeah, so that they can just stand for these agendas and, and, and have an outer facade that people are only seeing, you know, that one layer or, or just, and there's layer upon layer upon layer and so much galactic history and earth history. It's just insane. Yeah, I, I can't imagine just raising kids with the truth and with learning to connect with the land and, and and work with their own abilities and uh and that's you know, going to happen eventually yeah like it, it just it's it's over overwhelming when you can actually picture it and, and and you're just thinking why you know why there doesn't have to be bad if we don't project it so yeah it, it, finding a way to gain a hold of your thoughts especially for people like me is very important because that's something i worry about often and i and i i pray not necessarily to one god type thing but i i picture good things happening for the people in my life and sometimes it actually happens and that's when you've got to step back and realize okay maybe i should be more positive try to uh picture these things good things happening more often than the bad things and then maybe everything will start to turn out for the better well, I definitely, you know, turning lead into gold. I mean, that's why I say it, I didn't kind of expect that I'd have it as a title of, but, you know, global alchemist. I mean, we're all in this global alchemy, turning the lead into gold, the lead of Saturn into gold, and it's major transmutation and transformation. So we got to be okay, though, with going into the dark night of the soul and facing the darkness and, and allowing ourselves to move through anger and depression and just do our best knowing that it's not going to be an ongoing thing it's a catalyst it's it's temporary um because on the flip side of it uh is where our wisdom lies where our truth lies and it, and it's helping to us you know it can help us to wake up um if 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 we open our minds up enough to the downloads or greater higher communications um because if we don't we're, we just stay in the dark longer than comfortable exactly <laughs> yeah well it's it's been essentially seven years for me so yeah i think it's time to snap out of it and, you know, it's like an electrical circuit, you know, when I, I was doing research, uh, you know, love is, is, a, is a key element. It's basically the, the, the structure of the matrix and that uh, when you have uh, elements that are out of alignment with that, it's almost like an electrical circuit that will start to heat up and and burn up actually if it's too far out of alignment and uh, we're moving into a greater, greater alignment, you know, just like, you know, the gratitude and everything you see this uh, incredible uh, structuring going on where you don't have that with the discordant thought and so we're moving into a more of alignment with the matrix which is love and uh, you know and, and the, you know you think about the average person just trying to uh, deal with this they don't have time to really research history they've been exposed to yeah. like I have you know the history in high school and, and, and you go to the universities too and you and everything's been taught to you and science and everything they have no idea they don't have the time to look back and see how the Rockefeller took and rewrote what actually happened at the end of World War II to hide the Nazis escaping and infiltrating in with a plan called Velken Schalens Krieg which means worldview warfare which meant they they wanted to come in and, you know, with Operation uh, Project uh, Mockingbird with Alan Dulles controlling the media and uh, Project Dove with Hollywood and the uh, first movies that came out in 1951. They, uh, 1951 also the Invention Secrecy Act, of which I spent 10 years meeting with scientists and inventors, which uh, they put a secret system into the patent office called Sensitive Application Warning System. Anybody has a solution to get off nuclear oil or coal, they get one of these uh, national security orders saying you cannot release it. Thousands of these have been issued to, uh, and, you know, a lot of inventors and things have been you know murdered too trying to bring this out so they've kept us technologically re 
retarded, you know, through yeah. uh, our education, our media, our, our entertainment, uh, even people trying to come up with solutions for the world. They've kept us in this bubble of uh, where what when we start to talk about what's been hidden, it sounds so far out there, it sounds so science fiction-like right. that uh, it, it automatically, you know, promotes a rejection of, of these ideas because we've been we've been fed this uh, false reality for so many decades. Yeah. Right, and it's like if, if all of a sudden we were told that dinosaurs exist but we never learned about it in school, we'd have the same issue, like, wait a second, what? <laughs> right. Exactly. There's no freaking way. But because that was introduced in our early education, it's like, yeah, that's, it's just, that's, that's the power of conditioning. It's huge uh, to... to have to relearn everything, and that's that's the hard part. Well, the, the really hard part is how far back has history essentially been hijacked and rewritten? Now, th really, how far back was it? You know, is it was it like they say the Illuminati's that I did, uh, Adam Weishaupt, uh, and, and there's a, even a thing that he may have came over here and killed the original George Washington and took his place. Um, so it's like, what has been rewritten? What is the true history and what isn't? And at this point, I'm starting to think that almost everything we have... Well, yeah, everything we have seen, uh, you and I know this, uh, from your, the Vietnam War, from World War II, all this stuff, everything has that other side. There's the political side, and then there's that supernatural element that is laughed at, utterly rejected by the people who are now in control of this technology. You, you brought up a good point about, you know, relating to, you know, going back to 1776 uh, when, uh, you know, Rothschild had Adam Weishaupt, you know, basically infiltrated the Bavarian Illuminati and they actually had plans in order to control the perceptions, you know, through their media at that, at that, at that stage. So, you know, you have, you know, you have Alexander Hamilton, which was the Rothschilds cut out to basically to bring in the central bank in the United States. You have, uh, and you look at all of the uh, presidents, CIA directors, people who are the mover shakers in the world. They're usually members of, you know, high level 33rd degree Freemasons, of which my grandfather was one and my great grandfather was the 32nd. Uh, and you have people who are skull and bones, you have people who n are Knights of Malta, which, you know, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who did the restructuring under Eisenhower to restructure the CIA MJ-12 operations in order to give them plausible deniability. Um, he was a Knight of Malta. In fact, uh, researching, I found that Eisenhower was a Knight of Malta. Are you aware of that, uh, Laura? Uh, and I no, I I have a I I just like I have so much to ask you um, to help me understand a lot about things about Eisenhower I don't know, but don't do you think he had good intentions for humanity or do you feel like he was really sucked into these dark agendas, or do you feel yeah. like he was in a power struggle with them because there was really no way to fully escape it perhaps or I don't know. Absolutely, yeah. He he was definitely indications was. He, he was a good man because look what happened when, uh, you know, he was troubled, you know, as General Lovkin on his staff, you know, he was very, very troubled that, you know, and he, he tried to warn the American public, you know, only an alert, knowledgeable citizenry, you know, mm -hmm. beware of the misplaced powers within the industrial military complex. In other words, the corporations that were infiltrated with, the, you know, they had pre-war arrangements with these corporations before and after the war that came in and basically uh, did that. And then, you know, when once he once he completely lost control with the denied access, you know, where he was sending over two CIA agents in order to, uh, you know, look at what was going on at Area 51 and S4, um, you know, he, he was basically, he threatened to go in with the, with the first army, you know. Oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, if he's doing all of that, you know, it didn't sound like a black hat to me. It sounds like a white hat. Oh, definitely. And he was <laughs> against all the spending. He didn't want to be all and, kinds and, of military and, spending. He said, I don't want to spend one penny more than, than is needed for defense. 
And most importantly was that he may be the one that was responsible for this whole turnaround. If he didn't set up that secret, you know, and Dr. Michael Sella can confirm on this too because he's, you know, I've talked to a number of the witnesses that uh, this U.S. Marine Corps intelligence unit was set up to guard our, uh, to safeguard our, our legal constitutional republic in the future and q may just be the seed that he's he put forth all the way back in 1955 that you know surfaced in uh in 2017 so he may have been the one that saved the entire planet you know well it's amazing because i mean i i almost asked that question weird about because i know in my heart of hearts a lot of this information and i I mean, he's been a spirit guide since day one. I mean, he, he pretty much put me and my husband together. All of a sudden, my husband doesn't even channel or anything. He's like, I didn't know I was trying to get my attention, saying, go get her, go get her, because I was literally falling through the cracks. I was, I just almost didn't make it, and he got me right in the nick of time, and he's just been so close to my heart. And um, I, get, I, I, I guess I'm just... Uh, you know, wondering, you know, I, I, I don't think I asked that in a way that was really coming from a, a true question. It was more the power struggle part of it. Um, I mean, you got he that had, DNA it, resonance going on with him. It's, um, <laughs> you know, that other people don't have. Say that again? I said you have that DNA resonance going on with him. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we definitely, I, I, I get all sorts of interesting information from people saying, um, you know, interesting things about our connection and uh, the future, you know, that he was briefed about uh, a future descendant being born. I get, you know, th these uh, really powerful channelers just sending me, like, really interesting stuff. And so I take a lot of it with a grain of salt, but I really feel it, like, because I'll get, like, the goosebumps or something will happen to my nervous system and I'll, you know, I'll get emotional or feel like I'm going to, you know, really kind of, I don't know, because it's a lot. And I've been processing with him a lot just beyond this physical realm um you know these challenges and and we're just this great team you me i mean all of us that are doing this work i feel like we're a family and we all um have the same intention for humanity and i just feel that just strength and power of the numbers you know just growing and it's really quite incredible i just i guess i get kind of caught with the a lot of the timeline stuff uh time travel That is the end of part one. It is 11.56 my time. Um, that was a, a fun interview to do. It started off rough. It was, I, I kept, I was having a really hard time focusing on uh, anything because I was really pissed that my computer was screwing up on me. But uh, once again, before we're out for the night, I'm Steve Crawford. This is Factor Theory Live. Donate, go to the store scroll down hit that patreon button use snail mail tell all your friends share all this stuff go to the youtube page go to the facebook page uh yes and patreon and just uh do what you can to spread the word if you don't have bucks that's understandable but you can uh share a lot of these shows for the hosts that'd be a great help so for Ontario and the Niagara region I just finished my medicinal marijuana it's legal here have a great night everybody hopefully they'll play something soon because I don't have nothing to run through midnight but, uh, have a great night